Hello, friends, and welcome to the very first Women's Freelancer Friday. I had an epiphany over this past week, and I decided there's so many amazing women-led projects. Um, I want to bring them all up today on Freelancer Friday to just talk about what they're doing. Um, and some things we're going to be talking about today is how um, each of these women got started on their entrepreneurial journey, what keeps them inspired and motivated, and why is it so important that we actively pave pathways for marginalized groups in tech, um, in, in Web3 specifically. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass the mic over to our speakers to uh, do some introductions. Yeah, go GMGM ahead. GM friends. Thank you so much for having me today. Super appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit more about what we are up to at the Disco. Um, my name is Evan, and together with my awesome team of Disco Nuts, we are building your identity for the connected metaverse. So what does that mean? Um, we have built a web app that we describe as your data backpack. So we allow you to use your MetaMask wallet and Chrome browser um, on mobile or on desktop to own and control more than just on-chain tokens. You can now also, in addition to your fungible and non-fungible tokens, own and control pieces of data written about you that are um, off-chain, meaning that they can be uh, consent first, so you only share them when you choose to. They are revocable or can be set to expire, so they complement our public on-chain immutability with data that can change and evolve like we do because we're humans. Um, and they're stored in a form that doesn't require any gas fees but can be interpreted and relied upon in a trust-minimized way by anyone with an internet connection, regardless of what protocol they're using, Web 2, Web 3, or even in physical space. So at Disco, we care a lot about design justice. Our team is really focused on ensuring that the diversity of folks who contribute to our process reflect the diversity of users we hope to serve. Uh, and in terms of my own journey, I was really fortunate to um, first have the world's most uh, amazing computer science professor of all time, a little over, gosh, 12 years ago now when I was an undergrad. Um, and she introduced me to the wonderful world of open source software and Creative Commons licenses, and that led me to Bitcoin. And so for me, learning from you know other young women in uh, this emerging field of technology helped me feel confident that this space was for me too. And so that's why it's really important for me on my nights and weekends when I have a moment to be an active member of communities that are creating a bigger tent and welcoming more people into the Web3 technology ecosystem. Um, so those include spaces like Boys Club, boysclub.vip if you're not already familiar, global community of women and non-binary people in Web3, um, and you know, super love learning about all of the different ways that communities like Boys Club, SheFi, HerDAO, BlueDAO, Metagama Delta, and more are, um, are making a lot of these technologies accessible to new skill sets as well, from product to design, UX research, and all that we need to make a thriving application layer so that human beings who interact with apps as opposed to machinery that interacts with protocols can be part of our very near future in Web3. Uh, and I'll, I'll hand it off to my co-panelists. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evan. And, and I just want to bring attention for all attendees here today. I just shared two tweets um, on this space. So the first one are the two projects that Evan's most active in. Um, the first being disco.xyz and the second being Boys Club Crypto. I linked out to their zine um, that you can mint. And I also just released our partnership announcement with Disco XYZ. So Disco XYZ is one of our newest coalition partners. So welcome, Evan. Thank you so much for joining the coalition. Um, and I'm really excited to just build this partnership and continue building community together. So yeah, next we will pass the mic over to Mariah for introduction. <laughs> I was so hyped. Congratulations. Yes to Disco joining the coalition. Yes to you. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. That is amazing. So I have to put a shameless plug, right? Um, I'm an ambassador for Opolis, and this is a part of my passion and <laughs> to make sure that Gotta seriously. get the clap. Seriously though, I, I have to I have to let you guys know because this is so huge and massive in terms of how we're able to onboard the world. This is it's more than like I we have to stop even <laughs> creating all these different segments and whatnot because it's really just about 
leveling the playing field, if you will, right? And making sure that this is an equal opportunity and it's accessible. So I am so proud. Congratulations to Disco joining the coalition. Um, your community is in for a complete and total treat that they all deserve and um, that I believe all freelancers are really <sighs> supposed to have, right? If we're going to talk about rights and justice, but we, I won't, I won't get on that pedestal. Um, a little bit about me. I started in Web3 before I knew what Web3 was. <laughs> um, just like I had gotten into software engineering and web development before I realized what it was. So my technical programming background really comes from MySpace. <laughs> I'm of that generation, and I was able to develop a hobby into a masterpiece of an agency way back when. So long story short, um, <laughs> no, really cool, really cool stuff there. But and I don't want to get into uh, like technical things like that. But long story short, um, I was able to get a really cool job. And I realized that I was a part of an integration or a beta segment, if you will, of really creating the nodes um, for Ethereum and Ethereum Foundation. And shortly realized, hey, it's time for me to really hone in on decentralization and cryptocurrencies and where this is scaling in terms of enterprise, right? And also governance, if you will. So from there, um, I was able to really get involved with DAOs, and I got <laughs> super close with Nader and a few other organizers of Developer DAO, and joined their team with the initiative and the mission as well to again level this playing field to actually show my face. Right, there was no. PFP or project that I was a part of. It was me so that my community and the public understood that this was about self-sovereignty. This is actually about you, right? And your identity. So when I say I'm so excited for Disco to be a part of Opolis Coalition, I am stoked. Um, and that's just the, the technologist geek in me and the evangelist of blockchain and why we're here for Web3. So I won't continue to hold the mic, but I am honored to be on panel. Thank you so much, Rachel, for asking me and inviting me to be here. And I can't wait to hear from everyone else. Passing the mic. Uh, thank you so much, Mariah. I feel like it's an honor for us to have you here. Like you are the most like, I feel like you're one of the most quote worthy people. Like I struggle to not want to retweet all of your tweets every day. Like they're just super insightful. Um, and I'm also really excited about Disco joining the coalition. I feel like some of the values that uh, projects like Disco embody are really inclusivity, right? And like just welcoming people with open arms into their community. And I really love the vibe of that. I try to embody the same virtues at Opolis and just welcome everyone that wants to join, you know? Um, yeah, so we'll pass the mic over to Quantum Alpha to give her introduction. Hi next. there. Um... You know, you are the embodiment of inclusiveness and acceptance. And um, I mean, since the moment I met you, you've really just have helped us so much with your inspiration. <laughs> oh and I, seriously, I see what you do and so much energy that you have and the amazing women that I have met through you, you are a connector and that is like one of your many superpowers. So you are absolutely the, the super inclusive connector. You're, you're a super conductor is what you are. You were forced to be reckoned with for sure. And I am so grateful and honored. Whoa, that, I, that just made, made my life quantum alpha like that. That means so much just to hear like, uplifting supportive words like that like you are one of my favorite humans in web3 oh. um and i feel like I, I just believe in the goodness in people and i try and tap into that and i always believe like i have a lot of conversations throughout the day and i meet with different projects and i'm always just trying to creatively brainstorm how can we build a symbiotic connection here how can we support each other in some way and there usually is some way to do that and i believe in investing oh absolutely in people, right because that that comes back no, I mean, like, it, it, for, it's... for inclusive. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say there, there's always a way to, I, I just feel like literally your vibe attracts your tribe. And when you're on the same frequency as other people, you find that way to, you know, you don't even find the way the way finds you, right? Like I feel like stuff comes to me and people come to come into my life. Like there's a reason why we all connected and things like that. So yeah. And one of the things that I'm really trying to do is like learn to trust that a little bit more and lean into it. Because once I do that, it becomes so much easier. And instead of trying to fight the outcomes and always have the outcomes in mind, like, oh, it's going to be like this, and it's going to work like this, and everybody's going to do it like this. <laughs> That's never how it works. And I learned exactly. a really good lesson about that this week. <laughs> So life anyway, is what happens when we're busy making other plans. Absolutely. absolutely. So uh, I don't want to get too, too sidetracked, but I just, you know, thank you so much for um, inviting me to speak on behalf of Metagamma Delta Dow. Um, we are a uh, femme friendly, but we love our uh, LGBTQ non-binary. We love our friends and allies and um, the thing that I love about MGD is we invest in projects. We will we will put in you know micro grants or grants for projects that we believe in to try to promote women in the Web three space. Um, it could be anything from storytelling and writing to developing a new app. We've even we've currently um, sponsored a um, a coder. She's working as an intern. And um, her platform came to us looking for a little bit of help um, to be able to keep her paid. And so we were able to issue a grant for that and be able to extend their payroll for her, which made us really, really happy. Because to me, that's like really having an impact on getting, getting women and keeping women in Web3. Um, but my, I kind of started my journey. My journey was kind of weird. I, I first learned about crypto back in 2012. I was volunteering for another project and I met some Bitcoin miners and they were telling me about this. And I was like, oh, that's the craziest thing. That'll never work, as everybody says when they first learn about crypto, I think, because um, you just think, oh, my gosh, all it is is like one good hack and it's gone, you know, Mount Gox. And um, so fast forward to 2020 during COVID, I, I had a... Um, e-commerce business and it basically got shut down because of covid it was great up until covid but then once covid really hit and then shipping supply chains everything stopped and i wasn't able to send an inventory and i send an inventory by the pallet and i can't send anything in so that pretty much you know will crush any business. And I wasn't in love with the business, but the thing that was good about it was it got me out of corporate America because at the time I was working at for an investment firm and and it was a great experience. I worked in the I ended up working. I started at entry level um, answering shareholder emails and things like that. And I loved the company. It had a great culture and I worked for really good people all throughout. And basically worked my way up to the investment uh, team, working as an equity research um, assistant, basically. And so it was a great job, and I really loved it. And I loved my boss. I he was one of those bosses that made me want to be a better person. So I always think about that. And I'm like, I want to be that kind of person. I want to be the kind of person that inspires other people to do their best and show up in their best and things like that, inspire people. Um, but I've always had the dream of working for myself. I've Ever since I was a little kid, I remember growing up and my dad was a scientist. And when he retired, he ended up working for himself. He was translating documents from Japanese manufacturers into English because a lot of them like Toyota and Honda, they have plants in the United States where I was, where I was growing up. And so he would be able to translate documents. And I just remember as a kid, like I'd hear the, the fax machine and the dial up modem back in the day, like at three in the morning, I'd be like, Oh, dad's working. And I just love the idea that he could work whenever he wants. He could work for whoever he wants. He could work from home. He can work at three in the morning if he wants, if he's feeling inspired. 
and he can take naps in the middle of the day if he wants to because you know to me that's like total freedom having so much control over your life that is like that is self-sovereign freedom and that is amazing so i've always had that dream in my head and so fast forward to 2020 my business is going going down i didn't love it anyway i had a whole bunch of other stuff that was going on i get this message from a um, business associate of mine and he says hey i've got this group of day traders they're currency traders and um i don't know if you'd be interested in this but they're they're going to start up a workshop you can learn how to trade and stuff like that you may like it you may not like it and I was like, oh, I've always wanted to try day trading. That seems so sexy. That seems like such a cool thing to do. And so I joined with this group. And one of the coaches was a crypto trader. And so I saw like what had happened. Oh, my gosh, crypto is a thing. And this thing has really grown since I first poo-pooed it back in 2012. I happened. So then I started doing some research on it. I catch Real Vision's interview, two-hour interview with Michael Saylor on Bitcoin. I watched the interview from beginning to end. I've never watched any interview from beginning to end, much less a two-hour interview. I watched it twice. That's how good it was. And I just thought, oh, shit, I missed the boat on this. <laughs> and I just, I, after that, I was just like, oh, this is my sign from the universe saying, you know what? It's time to give up the e-com business. It got you out of corporate America. It made you, it forced you to make some really hard decisions. It was scary AF to leave a very comfortable, very well-paying, tons of insurance, like all the perks to leave that. Uh, and that's what got me out of the corporate space. And that that gave me my life back, basically. And so ever since then, I've just been diving into crypto blockchain um just all of that smart contracts the investment side of it the building side of it i mean it's all so exciting to me and i just haven't looked back and i found metagamma wow. and um yeah so that's what i've been doing and i just feel like this is my calling this is like what i'm meant to do so that's why i'm just really excited about the space that that's so inspiring thank you for sharing your story and it sounds like you've really found your purpose being here in web3 and you know i feel like a lot of us that took the plunge and, and as jaris would say reached our breaking point of the corporate nine to five world um i feel like it really stems from a feeling of lack of fulfillment and i feel like that we all join the space looking for a sense of fulfillment and i often talk about ikigai finding your life's purpose through what the world needs what you can get paid for, what you're good at, and what you love. And I feel like Web3 and DAOs and, and what I do at Opolis really intersect between those. Um, so I do have some questions here pre uh, prepared today for you ladies. And just for the attendees to take a look, I've shared some tweets out. Um, I shared ways to get connected with all the women here today. Please give them a follow. Check them out on social media, on, on Twitter, to just follow their journey. They're, they're amazing women here today. Um, so give them all a follow. I also made a post on uh, Women's Day. Just I, I tagged every woman that I could think of in the Web3 space that's doing really amazing things. So I shared those tweets as well. Um, and also resources to get involved at Metagamma Delta. Um, so moving on, the next question that I have for you ladies today is what are some challenges that you faced as a woman entrepreneur and what are the methods to overcome some of these challenges? I would say that, you know, a lot of the challenges that we face as women are the same challenges that builders face regardless of their gender identity. But the way that we go about solving them and the environment in which we are building them is just a different experience for us. Uh, I think we have an unfair advantage in that we understand what it feels like to not represent the majority view of a room of people, of a network of validators. And so being able to, you know, assemble a, a band of assassins to tackle an unwieldy problem where, you know, some of those folks represent the views, you know, and, and life experiences and needs and safety, psychological and physical safety requirements that are different 
than the majority of folks, you know, in your given given Web3 GitHub repo. Um, and so I would say that, you know, for me, I, I always try to think about, you know, how might we leverage underrepresented perspectives as an unfair advantage when our goal is to serve everybody, not those who are, you know, not just those who are already on this Twitter space with us here today. Um, now, I will also say that, you know, there is always a challenge, regardless of the industry, of walking into a space or a room uh, and not sharing the life experiences or identity of the majority of those who are in power. And that, you know, it reminds me that in moments like that, blockchains are feminist protocols. They are not opinionated about the gender identity of their users. It is the social layer of human beings and the applications that they build that can gatekeep based on their accessibility, the language that they use, the way that they include people in their conversations from standards to just parties. And so the hyper concentration of power in voices of, you know, people like influencers, whether positive or negative, is a reality of our space. And so I think, you know, spaces like this, opportunities to converge. So thank you so much um, to the Opolis team and, and Rachel for, for convening us here today. Um, I think this is our superpower to be able to address those challenges, um, you know, with an unfair advantage given our experiences and who, you know, who we show up as when we come to the table. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Evan, for sharing that. And, and I'm curious if any other speakers here um, have any input on challenges that you faced as a woman entrepreneur? I can absolutely add in. Are you kidding me? I was too busy tweeting because I just had to quote my girl there. Um, did you all hear what she said? Okay. I, I just... I'm hoping that you all did understand what she said. It's just to reiterate, um, the fact that we do have this advantage of already knowing what a majority that does may or may not have assumed power or control already lets me know that we're moving in the right spaces, in the right direction, at the right pace, and doing all the right things. So when I think about challenges, it's more so about solutions that I'm having to create. Um, exactly, exactly, for the next woman or the next person that will potentially hit that same roadblock. Um, so for me personally, it's been more so about... Um, having to solidify ethical systems, if you will, because within DAOs and governance, especially in Web3, um, the truth of the matter is that those shareholders and those that are actually <laughs> making a decision in treasury, in operations, within management and administration, do not reflect <laughs> their entire community of that DAO or organization. So it's really been my most recent prerogative, right, to make sure that, if anything, those unheard and underserved voices are actually being recognized because I know what that felt like. I know what it meant and what it looked like to be um, the very first person uh, to have an opinion, right, that did go against what was already written in a proposal. And that takes a lot of courage, um, confidence, strategy even sometimes for you to navigate. So for me, it's been really more so about leveraging what really was just mentioned, the fact that we actually have the resources and the tools and it's more so about creating better systems to allow them to be accessible. So just just more solutions for me, right? And within DAOs, I, I've really been paying very close attention because, excuse my, my pups, they travel with me, so they're excited whenever I get excited. Even though I know it sounds like I'm calm, but I'm super excited. Um, <laughs> they are, they're just going out of their minds. But anyways, uh, I've been trying to, like I said, pay closer attention to what's happening within the governance and the proposals of our DAOs and our decentralized organ organizations because 
they aren't necessarily as decentralized as they may seem. And that was the only reason that I made the initial jump, if you will, into Web3, right? Because I realized that that was an inequity that was already being positioned. So it was going to be someone else's prerogative to make sure that that remained balanced, if you will. So, yeah. That is super insightful. And I, I want to um, highlight something that you said that is especially important for us all to recognize as builders in this space, is that the economic incentives of a lot of Web3, especially token models, are based on asymmetric alpha, who has access to the information. Um, and so when I think about the distribution of reputation in net new networks, who is giving out that reputation? How is it being distributed in a way that is not unfairly biased based on who's starting out? Um, and so you make a really thoughtful point here about requirements and parameters for ethical building. So whether it's toothbrushes or cars, builders throughout our existing ecosystem today use um, you know, methods to define how they can minimize risk and harm to their users. So for example, in the identity ecosystem, we have the seven laws of identity set forth from Kim Cameron in 2005 that help us minimize risk and harm to people when we build identity systems through things like minimal, you know, minimum disclosure, sharing your data on a need to know basis, et cetera. And so when we are building with really powerful tools that are public and permanent, we need to make sure we're doing so in a way that does not unduly, whether we plan to or not, bring risk and harm to marginalized communities, where we know that disclosing the traits that are used to marginalize them can be harmful in Web 2. So we want to make sure we're not replicating that in Web 3. Oh my, I'm, I'm loving all of this so much. I feel like you ladies are really the driving force behind the projects that will really change the game in this space and like be more inclusive and more uh, regenerative, inclusive systems. And I, I love that you guys are thinking in this direction. And my next question that I actually had, and, and um, Evan, I know you can speak to this more, is uh, what tools and strategies um, are you using in order to, to achieve this future of inclusivity uh, of, of regenerative systems that empower individuals? And I know, Evan, you've been talking a lot about a decentralized identity backpack. So feel free to share about that now if you'd like. So right now, when I look out at the audience, you know, if I were to only know your Web3 public addresses, all I could see are piles of tokens, not fully fleshed out human beings or even avatars with, you know, bios and, and the ability to express themselves in a way that, you know, reflects their, their full expression. Um, and so in order for us to bring more to the table in Web3 coordination than just public tokens, we need uh, the ability to have data that is ephemeral and legally compliant. We got to build street legal here in Web3. So in order to uh, enjoy the capability of privacy, of uh, data that can expire or be revoked, and you know we can prove that it's been deleted, um, that's sort of the, the basis of how we at Disco see a more equitable future. The ability to selectively disclose traits that can be used to marginalize us while also still empowering the free flow of permissionless interaction. I love it. And, and just for a moment to touch on um, Opolis, I see Opolis is a really useful tool for empowering individuals to become self-sovereign. Um, it's something that I wholeheartedly believe in as, a, as becoming a public uh, global utility. It's actually something I was having some conversations about today about how to get this to the most amount of freelancers as possible around the world. Um, and I'm really grateful for the Opolis team for being here, for our ambassadors, and just continuing to show up and educate about this. Uh, most of you here are familiar, but if you don't know about Opolis, we're a member-owned digital employment cooperative. And what we're doing essentially, and this is not just limited to the Web3 space, it's for any independent worker, any independent contractor, business owner, um, we help you get set up with your own LLC. If you don't have one already, we get you set up with W2s, pay stubs, benefits, everything you need that you would get from like, say a corporate position with all the freedom of freelance work. So we believe that every person should have ownership over their employment and we give them the tools to achieve that. Um, so yeah, I'm curious from other speakers, like what, what tools, um, that you would recommend for, for achieving this future of self-sovereignty? I would I would say, I mean, initially, first, just being open to the education, right? And this, 
entirely new paradigm that we're entering. The The truth of the matter is that <laughs> we're revolutionizing the system, if you will. What Evan has created in terms of customizing our digital identities and then allowing it to remain compliant and secure is a solution, right, that we've needed in order to continue to sustain and stay safe within this space. And we didn't have um, those or that level of, um, I wouldn't even say like technology because it, it really is courage. <laughs> Evan, you're so dope. We didn't have that that level of, of leadership, of um acumen of strategy of like whatever you want to call uh, someone that is willing to be a pioneer in this space and provide a solution that our counterparts or the higher ups or you know um, other powers that be would be completely and totally against is a tool that you need to be open to. And like, I think that that starts with just being um, aware of the truths of this space and that it isn't all happy go lucky, right? And that we do need to be conscious of who and where the builders are that are providing those ethical solutions. Because um, I think the most important tool, like I said, is really going to be how we evolve as a collective and share the access to the information. Because I'm sure that there are thousands within Web3, if not millions, right, that believe the space is actually decentralized, <laughs> that believe somehow their wallet is secure, that, that don't um, understand that it may not be enough to have a, an ETH domain, right? So I think the most important tool for the fourth time is being open to the education to learn more on what it is that you'll need because this is going to be a, a personalized tool stack of technology, if you will, that you'll need, right? And um, it's going to take you independently, like, what Opolis does for independent contractors to do that research and education for yourself so that you can navigate the space successfully. Kind of the way I well, see Opolis and it's I, I'm... is, oh, I was just going to say, if I could just interject really, really super quick is for me, like Opolis represents a huge piece of freedom because I know from people in my e-com community, one of the biggest things that holds them back or holds a lot of people back from leaving their jobs is because they have insurance, because they have dental, because they have medical, because they have all these other um, safety nets. And when you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm, I, I don't have any insurance. What if something awful happens? What if my kid gets sick? That sort of thing. And I, I know I've told you the story, Rachel, but I, this is this is just one that is like really amazing to me. Is I know somebody who she said she has said that she would never have been able to leave her Web two world, and she's like in a very non non blockchain world. Like she's in television, she's in ho she was in Hollywood, and she wanted to make the move into Web three, and she says she that she would never would have been able to do it with any bit of confidence had it not been for Opolis, because Opolis gave her that freedom and the security that she knew that some health issues that dealing with would be taken care of. And that's, that's amazing to me. Like being able to provide that kind of service is huge because we all know how messed up the, our healthcare system is in general. And the fact that Opolis is able to provide something like this to help people leverage their self-sovereign state is amazing to me. I mean, that's, it's like things are coming together. There's, there's a big sea change that's coming in, in the world of work and Opolis is a huge part of it and wouldn't be possible, I don't think, without Opolis's contribution to this. 
ecosystem. Um, thank you so much. That's like one of the most beautiful testimonials that I've ever heard. Thank you, Quantum Alpha. Um, I have heard from other people in the space. I think uh, if we still have Jairus on the call, I, I believe he said that before about Opolis and uh, one of our colleagues at Bankless Dow and at Thinker has also said that as well. And it's just so refreshing to hear that we are providing something that allows people to take the leap into a space that they feel that they can find fulfillment. I don't think anyone should stay at a job where they feel unfulfilled or stuck. And it's really refreshing. And it just feels so good to be a part of a movement that's empowering people to do what they love and not be chained to any singular corporate entity. So moving forward on the other questions I have, and I know we're getting towards the end of the hour here. So um, I want to welcome any other women or just anyone on this space in general that want to come up and share their thoughts, questions with the speakers, um, anything you'd like to ask or share, feel free to come up and grab the mic. Um, I want to end uh, here with one final question for you guys. Um, so the current projects you're working on, what's on the future roadmap for each and uh, what are the best ways for our audience to connect with you and contribute to these projects or get connected? Well, for Metagama Delta, we are in the process of we're in um, a grant. We're, we're on we're grant hunting right now I, as a fundraiser. That's my that's my that's my jam. And so um, I'm working with a team. I have Ethereal with me and a couple of other people that are helping me research this. Um, but we are on the search for grants and we are planning to start up our grant program. We'll be opening it back up in September. Um, we're going to get our coffers back up and be able to start issuing some more grants this fall. And we'll be doing a more formalized um, grant rush, if you will. Um, and so I've been working on that and um, also looking at some longer term ideas for sustainability for the DAO as far as, you know, being able to get our people um, compensated for their time. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be monetary, but we do, we know, want to be able to recognize people who are contributing their time and treasure to, to us. Um, so I would say the best way to find out more about MGD is um, join our Discord. Um, I think you did, you did post that for us. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, but yeah, most of our yep. is, communication is done on Discord. It's not the best mode of, of con communication, but it's the one that we use. Um, so uh, you can definitely find me there and feel free to DM me if you have any questions or if you have any um, interest in finding out more about how to contribute. Um, we're always looking for people who are just interested in just jumping in. Um, I think that's the one thing that I would have to say to everybody is like Web3 is not for the weak of heart. You know, you have to be you have to be initiated. You have to want to be able to put up with all the glitches, all the headaches, all the speed bumps that come along. If something's not working, I just say, eh, it's Web3. All the Twitter space crashes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. But. You know, you definitely have to be brave and you learn to be brave along the journey. You know, you take more steps and you're like, oh, OK, I didn't die. That wasn't terrible. And then you learn and then apply it to the next lesson. So I feel like in that respect, entrepreneurship has really it. prepared me very well for Web3. Those are just my thoughts. And that's something I feel like. Quantum Alpha at our event that we did, uh, we actually hosted an event together during Biddle Week at ETH Denver, which was super exciting. And Quantum Alpha was, was a little hesitant at first. I was like, you should, I was like, you should come up as a speaker. And she wasn't sure. And and I just kept like pushing her like, hey, come on, come join us. You're going to do great. And she did it and just knocked it out of the park. Like she was super confident and formative. She facilitated a breakout group on mental health and work-life balance. And it just went so well. Like people were actively engaged. The room was packed. And I'm I'm just so happy that you took the leap with me and hosted an event at East Denver. Like that was that's something I'll remember for the rest of my life, honestly. Now I know we're getting into the last 10 minutes here. So 
Uh, just to circle back with Evan and um, Mariah. So what are some resources or ways for the audience to connect and, and what's on the roadmap for the future of your project? Um, in terms of the disco, we are so excited to welcome all of you to set up your data backpacks. Just visit app.disco.xyz or disco.xyz and you can click on through. We recommend that you enjoy this experience with um, Chrome and MetaMask on desktop, although you can also do MetaMask on mobile, though sometimes it gets a little finicky. You know how these things are swapping back and forth. Um, but we would absolutely welcome all of your thoughts and feedback, uh, your desired new features. Um, also welcome you to send one another a few GM credentials and then carry those over to the Disco Swag Store to be able to unlock some swag shipped to your house, uh, to the GM leaderboard where you can see where you stack up with other Disco Knots and how many GMs you've collected and build up GM streaks. Uh, we've got a whole host of many other integrations and other fun applications where your wallet can carry data uh, in your backpack from app to app in the same way that you're able to carry tokens. So very excited to welcome all of you to the live Discoverse right now. And, you know, you can experience the fun of using your keys for more than just money. Um, we're also really excited uh, to launch our, um, our Discord community starting on Monday. Um, so keep, uh, keep your eyes out. Um, we'll have uh, expanded Discord support um, and more community feedback opportunities. And so definitely want to make sure that we hear all of your voices as we build out and prioritize new features. Um, and then additionally, if you identify as a female or non-binary person, we definitely want to welcome you at Boys Club. So please check us out at boysclub.vip. Uh, follow um, at Boys Club Crypto. Uh, you can fill out a brief form. Just let them know that you heard about it from this, uh, this space here on Twitter um, and that I sent you. Uh, and we were, we'll be super excited to welcome you into the community, whether this is your first day in Web3 or whether you're a seasoned multi-exit veteran. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evan. I actually just shared um, a tweet that I made. Um, Evan actually was kind enough to take the time with me and show me how to use my decentralized identity backpack. So I'm stacking up my GMs. I've sent Evan a couple GMs and really loving the tool so far. Um, I got to give huge kudos to not only Disco, but Boys Club in putting so much care um, and just like attention to detail with the user interface and the marketing, it's just so on point, it's its art. Um, and I really love using the platform. Um, and I really feel like it, it does embody a platform of inclusivity, community building, communication, and I absolutely love it. So definitely set up your decentralized identity backpack um, and follow Evan to follow her journey at Boys Club and Disco. Um, so next I'll move on to Mariah. What's on the future roadmap of your project, your freelance work? And what's the best way for the audience to connect with you? Oh, my goodness. Uh, so much is on the future for our projects and our freelance work. And congratulations, Evan, on everything you're doing. I, again, am so proud of you. I just really want the audience to fully understand the weight and the greatness and the excellence and the brilliance of your work and your project and what you're doing and why. <laughs> ownership and full control and understanding of your digital identity is important. Um, so really congratulations to you, Evan. I wish you more and many and much success. And I can't wait to be on the disco. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love it. For me, you all, I am doing so many things within developer DAO. You guys can always reach me within our discord, follow us on Twitter. Um, I have a few threads that really share a little bit more about how you all can get involved with the DAO, whether that mean, you know, you need to connect with me for a partnership and you have a protocol or software network, whatever that looks like that needs to be integrated with the world's largest global community of Web3 builders. That's DD, developer DAO. Um, so definitely reach out to me there, but in terms of one of my most uh, recent projects that I would really like you all to get involved with and really just learn more about is really called the Culture Cards. And this project, yeah, it's it's really an, a peculiar Web3 project, right? Because what happened was is some industry leaders within entertainment, film, music, 
hip hop, R and B, all of those cool things, right? The culture, if you will, realized that there wasn't a project that actually represented and compensated those people. Wow, mind blowing, right? So what my my uh, business partner and colleague, and I was gonna say just like best friend, but this amazing gentleman, Fred Frenchie, he created a project that allowed some of our greatest pioneers within the culture, like Keith Sweat and Alicia Keys and A. Marie, like whether you're a musician, director, rapper, songwriter, it, it, it didn't matter, right? As long as you were a part of positive progress within our culture, he wanted you to be a part of the project. And the most riveting piece to it all you all is the fact that now these artists are regaining complete and total ownership of their data and their content and their music and really the rights to what it is that they have to offer to share so in you joining this project so if you do you know know anyone that may need this type of support this level of support and joining the project we also support you with Tons and tons of resources, but more so in terms of forensic attorneys and things of that nature so that you're able to regain control, right, of what it is you may have subsequently contracted yourself for. So we're really making sure that the culture and our community are able to grasp the economic advantages of blockchain and what it really means to own your identity and that data and how um, we're able to not only provide the access, but the opportunity. So the coolest part of the entire project is that now every talent and artist is literally peer to peer, if you will, <laughs> with their fans or their community. So you're able to join them on tour, you're able to get in the studio with them. If you wanted to like, schedule some Zoom sessions. There's tons and tons of things that each of the artists have put together in order to really share themselves with their community. So if you can, I would highly, highly recommend you follow the Culture Cards or Fred Frenchie one That's that's his uh, Twitter account. Could you repeat the name of the, the project one more time? Yeah, sure. Mariah? Yeah, sure. It's called the Culture. I'm about to, I can share a tweet with you. Uh, it's Culture what? The Culture Cards, and I've the Twitter account. Hold on, just follow uh, our CEO, Fred. That's what I want you to do, and I'll share this tweet. But um, that's that's the project that I would highly. I'm gonna share the tweet. I would. I want you all to know about and to be aware of, right? Because that's some industry movement and a, a revolutionizing, right, of the system when we talk about how we're able to support and empower artists and people that have literally made, you know, a revolutionary impact, if you will, within, across the world, within music and film and everything in between. So it's very impactful, super powerful, highly, highly encourage you all to get Mariah, if I could just say something really super, super quick. Sure. I love what you're saying because my very first career in life, like, as soon as I got out of school was working in the music industry. I worked for capital EMI. And one of the things that I think is really interesting now with blockchain technology is the ability for artists to be able to go direct with their fan base and not go through a record label or go through a distribution company that controls like everything, you know, that happens with the artists. So I absolutely love that. And I did see Dr. Kelly Page just joined us. Hi, Doc. Hope you're doing well. Oh, my God. Welcome, Dr. Kelly Page. I I have my soundboard up right now, so I'm not able to see the attendees because Twitter is Twitter. Um, <laughs> but uh, Mariah, you're actually a co-host, so let's get her up here. Actually, I think I just accepted her. Welcome, yes. Dr. Kelly Hello. Page. I am so sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I've been waiting for me and Dr. Kelly Page. We've scheduled so many I things. Know. And it's finally happening. She's here. 
we're at the end of the hour, I but know. I think this is worthy of extending at least like five <laughs> or ten more minutes. You are to give her a chance to say hi. The joy of the freelancer life, how quickly things change. So thank you so much. So Kelly, we're just talking about a couple different topics. Mm -hmm. So we went over how we got started on our entrepreneurial journeys, oh, wow. what keeps us inspired and motivated, and why it's important that we actively pave pathways for marginalized groups in tech. Um, so yeah, if you want to just give a quick introduction and like high level what you're working on, what the future uh, of your project looks yeah. like, um, you know, try and keep it like, five minutes. <laughs> in five minutes. I can definitely do that. So uh, my entrepreneurial journey started well over 25 years ago. Um, I was working as a researcher for a company in Australia, in Sydney, and I had an amazing opportunity to build with some ed tech uh, developers. And that was my first kind of foray into freelance and build and entrepreneurship. Um, and really what inspired my journey was how can we actually build learning technologies and systems that truly empower people to learn, create, build, and so forth. So I've been in like the ed tech space now probably over, yeah, 25 years. Um, and a big part of my work now in the last especially 10 years is how do we create space for uh, those that have not necessarily had the same opportunities, uh, are marginalized in some way um, to make truly make education accessible for everyone. So I'm working on a project which is um, really about using blockchain technology to free up especially learning data and educational data so that we own it if we created it. So, uh, yeah. And I love you, Rachel Rose. <laughs> I love you. Like, seriously, like, you inspire me. You embody all of the values and virtues that I look up to mm -hmm. in, in women in the space. And I find it really serendipitous. Like, I listen to you speak on um, the Meta Gamma Delta speaker series. And the next week, I was a speaker on that series. Um, but listening to you talk, uh, Dr. Kelly Page, like, the rest of my day was so much better. It was like a breath of fresh air. I'm like, she gets it. She gets inclusivity, totally. empowering other women. And I just love everything you're working on. And for our audience today, could you just um, break down the acronym? So L-W-Y-L, what does it um, stand for? So in -L this is it's Live What You Love and Live What You Love Studio. I've had my studio over 15 years now. Uh, and I have been doing consulting, contracting, all sorts of different projects, um, working on large development projects and small ones. And Live What You Love actually came out of um, a really bad employment situation one time. I'm going to tell the story. And um, I remember thinking to myself that it was a situation involving uh, a senior member of the organization who was bullying staff, specifically female staff. And I very much um, lent into, I read something, I think it was a book or a, a, um, a, an article, and at the end of it, it was all about living what you love. And I remember saying to myself, I'll always live what, you, what I love. Uh, they will always be a bully, but I will still live what I love. And I actually have it tattooed on my arm. So uh, oh my God, <laughs> the, acronym, wow. the acronym Live What You Love actually forms a heart because I believe people are the heart of social networks. And uh, it reminds me of that every day. It doesn't matter the situations we're in when people uh, treat especially marginalized minority groups otherly or differently. Uh, we have to remind ourselves, come together, support each other and elevate each other um, because there are ways of being that have been indoctrinated and conditioned in people for centuries. And it's our job to create space so that we can be different and do different. So it reminds me every day, live what I love uh, and elevate others. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I got chills <laughs> while you were sharing that. That's so beautiful. Mm. Oh my God. Um, we got so many gems on the space today. My heart is just so full. My heart is so full from this. Thank, thank you all, all you ladies that showed up today, everyone that came to support this space. Um, I know we are past the hour, but um, just thank you. My heart is so full. Um, seriously, you, you all inspire me so much.